It's October 28, 1995. We're at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia. Braves reliever Mark Wollers has retired Cleveland's first two batters of the ninth inning in a brutally tense one nothing game. If he can get past Cleveland's Carlos Baerga, the Braves will hoist their first championship after three World Series appearances in five years and 29 often long seasons in Atlanta. But Baerga can tie this game with one swing of the bat, keep hope alive for his team's dream season, and help the city of Cleveland into championship drought 31 years running. To understand how painful and proud these two suffering franchises, cities, and fan bases are, we need to rewind. If you're a Cleveland fan, Bayerga is a good pick for a storybook moment in this exact situation. And if anyone deserves a happy ending and a story about baseball, it's Cleveland. The city's ignominy in modern baseball is well earned. The entire time this franchise was in the AL East, from 1969 to 1993, Cleveland never finished higher than fourth place in the division and didn't have a single season in which they scored more runs than they allowed. Cleveland was so consistent at alternating between outright bad and hopefully mediocre that it became a brand unto itself when the tribe was memorialized in 1989 in Major League by Academy Award-winning writer David Ward. In a fit of wish fulfillment, Ward created a fictitious Cleveland team who miraculously goes from a laughingstock to a miracle winner to avoid being moved to Miami. As a kid, Ward fell in love with the team during their last truly good year, 1954, when Cleveland won the American League. Cleveland's 721 winning percentage in 54 is a live ball era record that still stands in 1995. But that team lost to the Giants in the World Series and Willie Mays over the shoulder catch is remembered a lot more than Cleveland's 111 wins. This Cleveland team came really close to winning 111, even in a strike shortened 144 game 1995 season, which is just insane. In fact, if you project the 95 team's 100 wins and 44 losses to a normal MLB season, Cleveland would have won 112 games, something no team in baseball's modern era has done. But how did a franchise in a three-decade slump almost set a baseball record for wins in a season? Technically, Cleveland didn't just explode out of nowhere in 1995, but they kind of did, thanks to the strike dominating headlines. At the stoppage of play in 1994, the team chased a playoff appearance, finishing just a game behind the first-place White Sox. But it all really starts in 1991, when a freshly promoted general manager named John Hart snagged a young outfielder named Kenny Lofton from the Houston Astros. As an assistant GM, Hart had also helped build a trade between San Diego and Cleveland for slugger Joe Carter, who went to the Padres for Sandy Alomar and Bayerga. At the same time, Cleveland's farm was developing a core of crucial draft picks from previous years, including Manny Ramirez, Albert Bell, and Jim Tomek. By 94, the killer lineup was in place, and in this nearly full 1995 season, they exploded. Led the majors in offense in almost every conceivable category, while a rotation of veteran pitchers dominated. Cleveland won the AL Central by a stupid 30 games and tore through the playoffs by sweeping Boston and beating King Griffey's Mariners in six to go back to the series for the first time since 1954. These Braves are much more familiar with October. This is their third World Series in five years, but they don't have a title to show for it yet. Tonight's one nothing pitcher's duel is emblematic of the style that turned Atlanta from a cable TV nuisance into a contender. Just like Cleveland, this Braves franchise has sucked for a long, long time. Since arriving at Atlanta in 1966, the Braves won their division just twice before the 1990s and were swept out of the pennant both times. In the early 1970s, fans were at least distracted by Hank Aaron's pursuit of Babe Ruth's home run record, but by the 75 season, Aaron was a Milwaukee Brewer and the Braves fell 40 and a half games out of first place in front of an average of just 6,600 fans in a stadium that held 53,000. Amidst a tepid local response to poorly managed franchises, the Atlanta media dubbed its own city's pro sports brand as Loserville, USA. In his book of the same name, author Clayton Truder details the woeful results of a well-meaning, fast-growing city that tried to fix its cultural disconnect and small-time image with a group of wildly mismanaged pro sports teams. The Braves were so bad in the 1970s, there's a famous story of a fan who parked 
in downtown Atlanta and left his tickets under his windshield wiper with a note that said, free tickets. When he returned to his car, someone had added a second pair of tickets under his windshield. But Atlanta's bad baseball shame also held a particular note in media history. Billionaire Ted Turner purchased the Braves franchise in 1976. He'd already been broadcasting all the team's games on his WTBS Superstation, which aired nationwide, and now he could guarantee baseball inventory for his national platform. Very bad baseball inventory. So from the mid-70s on, the entire country saw complete seasons of almost entirely losing baseball until the Braves' 1991 breakthrough. General Manager John Sherholtz and Manager Bobby Cox tore down Atlanta's roster, including trading franchise legend Dale Murphy to the Phillies to rebuild around a young core of pitchers. In 91, Atlanta did explode out of nowhere, going from worst to first in the NL West and taking Minnesota to a Game 7 before losing one of the closest World Series ever. The following year, Atlanta did the same, beating Pittsburgh in a dramatic NLCS and losing to Toronto in six. And this really isn't the best iteration of the team of the 90s, because unlike Cleveland, Atlanta didn't have a power offense. Young third baseman Chipper Jones led the team in runs, but only two hitters, Javi Lopez and left fielder Ryan Klesko, finished above 300, while power bats like Fred McGriff and veteran David Justice were serviceable at best. The team's 250 batting average was the second lowest in the NL, but especially and crucially in 95, the Braves were a pitching dominant outfit, namely the trio of Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, and John Smoltz. This season, the Braves were flat out of the gate, sitting in third until they ripped off 20 wins in 25 games before the All-Star break. Atlanta's batting was miserable in a strike-shortened spring, but the middle of their order started hitting home runs, and an ace closer emerged in Wollers, who posted an 86.2 save percentage. But just like Cleveland, Atlanta cruised to the series, beating Colorado three games to one and sweeping the Reds in the National League Championship Series. The first ever wild card and pennants were largely uneventful in baseball's new playoff format, as the two best teams in Major League Baseball looked destined to meet in the series. Baseball requires a team effort. So in 1995, the Sandlot Brewery at Coors Field paired its blue moon with an orange wheel garnish, a home run for beer and baseball. Born in a ballpark brewed by the spirit of baseball. So, Coming down to this at bat, one of these historically awful but suddenly powerful teams could break their bad baseball curse. Regardless of the history, this matchup was the 1995 season's number one versus number two. But historically, it did mean one fan base was going to leave here feeling horrible again. The one versus two title fight did not disappoint. Starting with an ace versus ace matchup of Maddox versus ALCS MVP Oral Hershiser, Atlanta won two one-run games to take a 2-0 series lead before going to Cleveland, where the home team took its first win of the series on an Eddie Murray RBI walk-off in the 11th. A record 18 pitchers were used between both teams in the second and third games, and Atlanta's aces threw well enough to even the offensive disparity between the two clubs. But Atlanta knew it had to manage its rotation perfectly to keep Cleveland's offense muted, and a massive decision came in Game 4 when the Braves started struggling Steve Avery instead of Maddox. And it worked. The Braves had built a seemingly unbeatable 3-1 series lead. Except for, you know, like 30-plus years of nationally reviled ineptitude and two very fresh Heartbreaker World Series losses. Except that. Sure enough, Cleveland won the second Maddox versus Hershiser matchup in Game 5 and sent the series back to Atlanta. One team needed to win two games on the road, which felt impossible, while the other was just waiting for another October mishap, which seemingly arrived in the form of a very strange distraction. David Justice, once a fan favorite, used the day off between Games 5 and 6 to completely dog out his home fan base. He conveyed to a Braves beat writer that the respect and excitement the team needed from fans had been in short supply, saying, quote, If we get down one nothing tonight, they'll probably boo us out of the stadium. He added that while the teams were in Cleveland, he couldn't help but notice their fans were still on their feet when the home team was down three runs in the ninth. If we don't win, they'll probably burn our houses down. He went on to say that even if the team did win, it wouldn't be for the fans. It's for the 25 guys in here, the coaches and Bobby. It's us against the world. 
Maybe this is a good time to mention that Justice, intended to be one of the team's best bats, was hitting 214 in the postseason without an extra base hit. Little time to process his remarks, fans piled into Atlanta Fulton County Stadium for another sold out World Series game, seemingly to prove Justice wrong in the building's ninth World Series game in just five years. And if the Braves blew another 3 2 lead in the series and lost another championship for Atlanta, this time at home, Justice would now be the dead center target of fans' ire. Yet another pitcher's duel commenced. Braves veteran Tom Glavin was throwing a scoreless gym opposite 41-year-old Dennis Martinez, the third oldest pitcher to start a World Series game. Tonight, Martinez fought a stiff shoulder and a torn knee ligament that kept him from starting Game 5, and also he's 41, so he's just exhausted, having pitched almost 3,800 innings of baseball in his career. Martinez made it four and two-thirds inning before allowing runners on first and second, but Cleveland reliever Jim Pohl is exhausted too, playing with bone chips in the elbow of his throwing arm. In fact, Cleveland's arms are all exhausted because Atlanta's rotation has forced this series away from the offense that won the Tribe all of those games this season and into a war of pitching attrition. With Glavin dealing, one mistake on one pitch for Cleveland is all the Braves need. Enter David Justice. A long drive to right. Ramirez turns to the track. She's gone. And just like that, this suffering sports town might have found its first championship hero in the last place they wanted to look. Day of justice, all is forgiven in Atlanta. Justice's solo shot won the crowd back immediately. Hey, that's Bill Murray. The justice home run gave Atlanta's starting pitcher the chance to be an unlikely championship hero. Unlikely because despite another Cy Young caliber season, the Braves' ace was dogged by angry fans all year, including at home, for his prominent role in the Major League Baseball Players Association during the 1994 and 1995 strike. Glavin drew consistent cheers, all while winning 16 games and holding down a three-ish ERA. But Cleveland's offense, the best in baseball, was limited to just one hit by Glavin in eight innings of masterclass pitching, and all was forgiven. Eight 300 batters in the league's best offense are now hitting 180 through six World Series games. The offensive explosion that rocketed Cleveland baseball back into relevance has just as quickly dissipated, boding another chapter of pain for a city bereft of titles. Bayerga is over three with only five hits and 25 at bats. He's called against a Braves team that built itself to do exactly that. Thus far in the Braves' storybook emergence, Atlanta's formula hasn't been able to shed the Loserville label and finish with a world championship. Wollers is one out away from Atlanta's fans and franchises shrugging off decades of national humiliation and calling itself a champion for the first time. Welcome to a moment in history. The wind and the pitch, here it is. Swung, fly ball, deep left center, Grissom on the run! Thanks to Clayton Truder. Thank you for watching. For more Secret Base, for more Rewinders, and for more baseball, click here.